Good morning. Throughout the record of the life of Jesus in the Bible, we read about his struggle against evil. In Luke chapter 4, Satan tempts him. And when Jesus resists, strengthened by the memory of relevant scripture, which he quotes to combat Satan, that frustrated devil leads him until an opportune time shall arise for him to return and attack Jesus again. In Luke chapter 22, the end of Jesus' ministry and his life nears. The opposition to him intensifies. Judas, one of his disciples, deserts him. And it has been suggested by numerous commentators that Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 46, record that opportune time in which Satan returned, for which he had been waiting. Jesus and his disciples left the upper room where they had celebrated the Passover, meal together. And they go, and it says, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And now the climax of Jesus' ministry approaches. Satan intensifies his temptation, and Jesus reacts to this temptation in the way in which he has responded to temptation throughout his ministry. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus had faced temptation after his baptism by withdrawing into the wilderness to pray and to fast. In Mark chapter 1, when crowds were thronging to him, wanting to be healed from their illness, Jesus had withdrawn again to pray. And it was when his disciples came to him and said, the crowds are waiting for you, they want to be healed, he had said, no, we need to go to the next town that I may preach there, because that is why I have come. So Jesus, when he was tempted, would pray. And now, once more, he prays on the Mount of Olives. But first, however, he tells his disciples that they too must pray. Because, as we learn in other passages, Satan has asked that he may sift them like wheat. They're going to need every ounce of spiritual strength that they can muster to get through the next few days to resist the great tempter's attack. In the, in the hours immediately ahead, the arrest of Jesus, his trial, his crucifixion, and his death are going to shake the foundations of their faith. And their status as associates of Jesus is going to make them afraid. And we read about Peter and his struggle as he's asked, aren't you one of them? And he denies three times that he even knows Jesus. But now before that, Jesus is telling him and the other disciples that they need to pray that they will not fall in to temptation. Because Jesus wants his disciples, whether it was the apostles then or you and me now, to be able to meet the tests that we encounter and to overcome them. So he tells them to pray. Because God will be the source of power who will enable them to overcome. The second here, and we must not overlook this, 
Jesus is facing great temptation himself. And as we read these verses, I think we can discern the kind of the strength of the temptation he's facing in several ways. First, by his posture, Jesus falls to his knees, and Mark says he falls completely on the ground. Rather than standing and stretching out his house, his hands, as was the normal Jewish practice. And then what he prays, what he says. Jesus says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. We sang those words a few minutes ago when the song night with Evan Pinion. Those words that Jesus prayed on this occasion. And we often focus on those last words, not my will, but thine be done. But the first words, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Notice the tension between what Jesus wants to happen and what he knows God wants and needs to happen. Jesus was God, is God, but was also walking on this earth as a human being, experiencing every temptation like as we do. Few of us have any great desire to die. We go to great lengths to be safe. I suspect that most of us drove much more carefully this morning on our way to the church building as we navigated our way through the ice, watching for those little black patches of ice that we might not see if we didn't look carefully. Because we wanted to survive, to be able to worship here together. Jesus realizes that intense suffering and death lie ahead for him in the immediate future. And unless there's drastic changes, and that's what he's praying for. Father, remove this cup from me. He does not want to drink that cup. He does not want to die. But he does want to do what the Father, what God wants him to do. The cup here is his destiny in life, what awaits him. And not the only time Jesus talks about the cup that he, that he is going to drink. In Mark chapter 10... Uh, James and John come to him and with their mother they ask that they might sit on his right hand and on his left that they might be in the positions of honor and power in his new kingdom. And Jesus looks at them and he asks them are you, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? And this cup in Mark chapter 10 is the same cup that in Luke chapter 22. Jesus prays, remove this cup from me. That cup is filled with suffering. And Jesus does not want to drink it. But he realizes that God may want him to drink it. When there's a difference between what we want and what we want, no, or at least suspect God wants. We have temptation. We want to do something else other than what God wants us to do. And when that happens, usually we have a struggle within ourselves. It may not be a great struggle. 
You may be so thoroughly grounded that you say, no, that's nonsense. I'm going to do the right thing. But on the other hand, you may really, really, really deep down want to do the wrong thing. And so you may ponder and you may wrestle and you may wonder, how can I excuse this? How can I justify this? How can I transform this? How can I convince myself that this is the right thing to do? We struggle. And as Jesus prays too, we can sense the struggle that he is experiencing through the evidence of the emotion with which he prays. When I pray before a meal, when you pray before a meal, normally not a lot of emotion there is there. Unless there's just been an unexpected reunion with a dearly beloved friend or family member right before. We just know, normally thank you, Father, for the food and But if we're afraid of disease or illness taking the life of, of a loved one or ourselves, if a soldier, if as a soldier we're going into battle, then the emotions are greater, and we pray with more intensity. And Jesus here is praying with intense emotion. Luke chapter 22 verse 44 says that Jesus literally says he was in agony as he prayed. It is this place in verse 44. The only time that this word for agony appears in the New Testament. This intense, intense struggle, inner struggle. His prayer is so intense that it says his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And some people suggest that Jesus here was feeling the weight of the sins of all of humanity as he prayed to the Father. But that's not what it says here in Luke. And it does not say that in Matthew, Mark, nor John either. What Luke says and what the others say is that Jesus prayed that night that he might not have to endure the pain of this trial and crucifixion. And I think we can understand that prayer. Remove this cup from me. If this was indeed the opportune time that Satan awaited to return to tempt Jesus, then this prayer was a battle for the future of humanity. Because Jesus was tempted to do his will, not God's, not the Father's. And his prayer reveals a spiritual struggle in the mind of Jesus, and he prays in agony. And how does he win this battle? First he prays. He turns to the Father in prayer. He doesn't attempt to win the battle alone, but he relies on God. And he knows that God can empower him to overcome. Marshall Keeble was a great preacher for the churches of Christ, and he was a man of prayer. He said on one occasion, through the night, I, I get up to pray. Nothing to do but pray. Then go back to sleep. I get power from it. I beg him to use me. To use me any way he wants to. 
And Jesus prays in Luke 22 because he knows that God can protect him. And like Marshall Keeble, Jesus prays here, doesn't he? For God to use him however God wants to do. When he says, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus overcomes temptation when he resolves to do things God's way, even though he might want to choose an easier option. God answers his prayer by sending an angel to comfort him. But even with angelic reinforcement, Jesus prays with such agony that his sweat is like drops of blood. The writer of the book of Hebrews reflects about this prayer of Jesus. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayer and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Finally, Jesus is able to arise and go to do God's will. He is able to arise and go to, back to his disciples. He is now ready to do not his will, but to do the Father's will. To paraphrase the next ver- that next verse of Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, he is ready to become the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Through prayer, he is overcome. He goes to the disciples whom he had told to pray so that they might not fall into temptation. And he finds instead that they are asleep. So when we compare what they they have done to what Jesus did, their posture is, while he was kneeling, while he was on his knees in prayer, and even perhaps prostrate on the ground, ground, They too are prostrate on the ground, but they are asleep. They, worn down, sensing that not is all well, have fallen asleep. And they have not prayed. While Jesus has since been praying, with agony, not my will, but yours be done, they have been saying nothing. And Jesus arouses them in their grief, sorrow induced sleep. He awakens them and asks, Why are you sleeping? Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Jesus has prepared for the temptations ahead, for the trials ahead. He will endure. He will meet the challenge. The disciples have not prepared. And they they will suffer for it. Jesus overcame the temptation to sin because he decided to do what God wanted done. He prayed to God about the situation. Considered what might have happened if Jesus had said instead, I know what you want, Father, but I'm going to do it my way. What a world of difference that would have made. We wouldn't be here this morning. Building wouldn't be here. Our world would probably be a much different place. 
And sometimes if you think life is, society is going in a horrible direction, think where it might be going if the teaching of Jesus had fallen silent if he had not risen from the dead. But no, Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. And because he prayed, not my will, but yours be done, we learn that, and, that Je- what Jesus knew, that God had a plan and a purpose for Jesus. Again, as Hebrews chapter 5 verse 9 says, Once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And he had been made perfect, The earlier verse had said, through his suffering. God also has a purpose and a plan, we're told in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, for us who obey Jesus, who receive his grace. And like Jesus, you and I, they agonize when we realize the implications of that work that God has for us to do. What it means to follow God. Because you and I have desires, don't we? We have dreams. And some of our dreams may not always align well with the plan of God. And so we struggle. Are you struggling to do God's will? Are we? Are there things that sometimes we pray about or we think about and maybe we don't pray because we're afraid to pray about it? Because we want to do it so badly? Are we humbling ourselves before God? And praying with intensity like Jesus did to be able to recognize as we read his word and as we pray to him what God wants us to do in our lives so that we may do it. Do we pray? Do we worship? Your presence this morning testifies that you are making an effort to worship God. That you've made it a priority today to be in the presence of other people who love God and want to do His will. Can we say, as it says about Jesus, that regular prayer and worship is our custom? Is it what people know about us? Are we seeking to do God's will? We have hope today. We have hope today because Jesus said no to selfish desires and sacrificed himself for you and for me. And he asked you and me to follow him in obeying God. Will you pray, not my will, but yours, O God? Will you demonstrate your commitment to God and to Christ by being baptized into him today if you have not already done so? If you need to obey the Lord today in either way, come now while we stand and we sing.